Hello, I'm Jenny Aidan Christie and this is a little tutorial about how to use and work with a slate frame. Um, a lot of people have asked me recently um, what the purpose of using a slate frame over other types of embroidery frame and how to go about framing one up. People are often a little bit nervous about investing in a piece of equipment that's a little bit more expensive and needs to last them a long time and they're, they're a bit unsure. Um, a slate frame is a little bit of a confusing term, so we're going to start by looking at what a slate frame is. Um, this is a slate frame here. It, as you can see, it's a square shaped frame and it's composed of two rollers at the top and the bottom. So these are the rollers and those are solid wooden um, round pieces with a piece of cotton webbing. It's really strong webbing attached to it um, with, with strong staples. They have holes at either end and into those two rollers, between those rollers are slid the arms here with the holes in. And it's by sliding those rollers onto the arms and by putting these little split pin pegs into those at equal distance on either side that tensions the rollers apart and pulls the fabric really, really tight. The frame is then pulled tight sideways by lacing with cord. And we'll look at how all those things work in a little bit more depth in a minute. But that's the basic idea. The reason for using a slate frame is because as opposed to the, the ring frame that, that many people use, you can have a square or rectangular piece of fabric as opposed to a circle. Ring frames tends to push a, um, a curved crease into fabric, which is difficult to remove, and therefore it limits you to quite small designs. Also, um, if you go, this is an eight inch ring frame. If you go any bigger than an eight inch ring frame, they tend to slip and lose tension very easily. And people also find them very difficult to, to have the strength to pull the initial tension in the first place to get that really, really smooth. Um, and I find that I, if I have a design anything bigger than something that will fit comfortably in an eight inch ring frame, I feel that I would prefer to use a slate frame beyond that just because for the amount of time you're putting into a piece that's, that's any size, you want to have the fabric at a beautiful taut tension. It produces more beautiful embroidery um, because your fabric stays beautifully taut and it doesn't wrinkle and crease between the work. It's therefore much easier to mount the piece when you've finished and it generally is much more delightful to stitch onto. You can hear from the tension on this frame that it's drum tight and it's just a, a divine process of, of working on that as opposed to fabric that keeps slipping and moving and jumping as you work. Um, so anything bigger than than eight inch frame sort of size piece of work I would tend to opt for a slate frame. Now um, why are they called a slate frame? Um, it's not known completely. It's a term that's developed over time but my theory on it is that because they pull your fabric taut like an old-fashioned drawing slate um, that children would have used in school and they work on that that slate as if you were drawing with a pen but here you're drawing with a needle and therefore slate frame so whether that's true or not but it makes sense to me um, so that's our example frame there um, I sell slate frames on my website shop which are made by my dear uncle who is a very experienced cabinet maker and he makes a lovely job. We've developed those over a period of time so that they are useful sizes and also are the right sort of strength, but weighing that up against the, the weight of the slate frame for smaller ones. So for smaller slate frames, we make them slightly lighter weight, but still very strong so that they're not so cumbersome to carry around and they fit into a stand more easily. And then as we get bigger, up to the bigger slate frames, we go for chunkier wood, um, so that they have greater strength and they aren't going to warp over time. Um, the joy of a slate frame is that once you have invested in one, it is a piece that, of equipment that you can use for life. They should last a lifetime and they just get more beautiful with wear really because the, the handling of the wood just makes them more and more beautiful. Occasionally the webbing will um, become distressed over time, particularly if by accident you snip it or something like that, or it's been under a, an awful lot of strain. Um, the webbing can however be replaced and we will always um, replace that for you should you ever find it needs doing, but it should last a very, very long time. So the sizes that we sell, this is a little mini eight inch slate frame. Um, 
super for little projects if you need exceptional tension on your fabric for that project. So as I said, you could use an eight inch hoop for a, a small project, and I find those are generally pretty good. They're so quick and easy to use, particularly these lovely deep frames, um, which we sell. Um, I've bound this one and that helps to keep the work really, really nice and tight. But if I was doing a really important piece and I wanted to have brilliant tension across the fabric throughout the project, say a piece of intricate gold work or, or something like that, I would still prefer to opt for a slate frame. It will always keep tighter for much longer. In fact, once you've tensioned it at the beginning of the project, it's unlikely to need tensioning until you've finished. Even if that was over several months to a year, it may need just one, one extra tension at some point. So for important projects, it's really, really worth using a slate frame as an option. So that's the little eight inch slate frame. We then go up to a, a 10 inch slate frame and I'll just explain what we mean by 10 inches. So um, this confuses people a lot. A lot of people think that 10 inch means the full length of the roller. It doesn't. 10 inch refers to the length of the webbing on the roller. That's important and that's why we refer to that because that's the maximum width of fabric that you can put onto your roller. Um, so it determines the size of piece that you can use on this slate frame. So this is a 10 inch slate frame because my webbing on there measures 10 inches. So I can have a maximum of 10 inches of fabric on there. So when you're deciding which size of slate frame to buy, um, we're looking at a 10 inch slate frame here, for example. So the webbing length on this frame is, is 10 inches long. And that allows us to have a maximum fabric width of 10 inches. So within that, you've got to think that you need a little bit of excess fabric either side beyond your design area. So if your design was about six inches, that would fit very comfortably on here because it would allow two inches either side for a little bit of excess fabric. It's nice to have that excess because you don't want to have your design too near the edges of the frame where there could be a little bit of distortion. You're more likely to lean on the design at that point as well. And of course, you need excess fabric when you come to mount the piece when it's completed as well, stretching it over a board. Um, so two inches would be the, the minimum, really. It's probably safer to opt for about three inches either side. And if you think that you may want to see plain fabric around your design when it's finished and also have fabric to stretch round to the back of a mounting board, it's better to go for a little more. So measure your design, find its maximum width, add those allowances either side, making sure you've sufficient fabric for, for your plans for mounting the piece when it's done. And that's the length of webbing and the size of slate frame you need. So the little 10 inch slate frame, this is what a really, really useful size for lots of small projects, lovely and compact for carrying around to classes and things like that. Um, and again, quite slender in its um, structure so that it's not too heavy. We then go up to a 12 inch slate frame and a 15 inch slate frame. So these become a little bit heavier, slightly chunkier to give um, a bit more strength over such a big area. And so they're not going to walk over time and this one is actually an 18 inch slate frame so a nice big one and we go up to a maximum of a 24 inch slate frame and um, we can also make bespoke slate frames we are making some at the moment for a couple of customers which are 72 inches long um, so they can be really big and of course um, the scale of the chunkiness of the slate frame increases as we um, go bigger accordingly So we'll now look at how to frame up a slate frame effectively and there's several methods for doing that but this is um, by far my preferred method and it's the one that I use all the time. Um, I've got a piece of beautifully fine linen cambric here and I've chosen this to show you that you can frame up um, a very fine fabric in this method um, and it's, it's perfectly okay um, for doing that. I've got a 15 inch slate frame on it so that's got webbing which is 15 inches long and um, I have done that because my design measures, let's see the design here, so it measures about eight inches across. So the 15 inches then gives me a good sort of three inches either side of my design to make sure I've got plenty of spare fabric for workability and for mounting when it's finished. Um, so when I've cut this linen, I'm going to have this edge running along the rollers 
of my slate frame like this. And um, that direction of your fabric should run with the weft of the fabric when it's coming off the roll, ideally. So if you think of that rule that the weft runs from left to right, and that's a good way to remember that. So it's running across east to west on your roll of fabric. So running away from me in this direction, that's running along the selvage of the fabric, north to south, okay? So the fabric is stronger with the um, warp direction, this way, and that's why we do it in that way generally, for, for strength, okay? Um, so I have measured my fabric like so. I have taken 15 inches across, and then I've added about a quarter of an inch on either side. That's because I want to use the maximum 15 inch width of my webbing, but I need a little bit extra either side, about a quarter of an inch or a centimetre or so for turning under on my fabric, which you'll see why in a moment. So to use the maximum width, 15 inches plus a couple of quarter inches, so 15 and a half overall approximately. In terms of the length of my fabric, I've made that a little bit longer. So this piece is 17 inches. That's because it's nice to have, although my design is fairly square, I want to have a little bit more fabric lengthwise so I can roll it onto the rollers of my slate frame slightly. It's better to have a little bit of fabric rolled on rather than just have the fabric sitting on the surface at the point at which it's stitched to the webbing. So allow yourself a little bit more length. Now, if you were working a very long design, a tall design, you can have the fabric as long as you like because the excess fabric is rolled onto the rollers of the slate frame. You expose one area to begin with and gradually unroll the fabric and roll it onto the second roller as you go, therefore allowing you to work through a long, tall project effectively. So the first thing when we, we cut the fabric, when you cut it in the first place, try to cut on the grain of the fabric. It's not always easy to see that, um, so do your best to begin with so you're not wasting too much. As it's quite tricky to be sure you're doing that accurately at the cutting stage, I often allow just a fraction more fabric to allow me to do what I'm about to do now, which is along each side of the fabric, I'm going to pull a thread of the linen until I achieve one linen thread which pulls all the way across the length of the fabric. And then I know that my linen is exactly on the grain. So to be sure you're not losing fabric as you do that and it's ending up shorter than you planned, just allow a little bit more at that initial cutting stage. And if you find it really difficult to cut straight, then allow yourself plenty. So you can do this a little bit at a time. So on all four edges, we're fraying the linen back until we have that continuous thread running all the way along. It's a really useful way of just making sure your edges are beautifully straight. If they're not straight, when you frame up by the, the method we're about to look at, you will find the fabric will distort a little bit and you're kind of setting yourself up for a fall from the beginning. Okay, so that's three edges and then the fourth edge here. I've also pressed my linen um, for a pure linen fabric, the best way to do that is I lay the linen flat in a bath of water, ideally as flat as possible. If, if necessary, I would just fold it loosely once, but I would never sort of fold it up into a bundle. Keep it as flat as you possibly can. A um, little bit of, of cool water in the bath and I just leave it to soak nice and flat. Um, if you've not got anywhere to, to lay that flat that, that's clean enough, you can also hold it um, between two hands, it's ideally with two people, hold it and run your shower over it and really soak it that way. Let it soak thoroughly until the fabric has become completely wet all over and you will see it darken all over. Once that's, that's happened, take it out by two corners and let the water drip out of it. Have a clean towel ready to the side, lay it flat on the towel, put another clean towel on top and just blot it all over to soak up the excess moisture. Take the linen out at every stage, don't scrunch it and, and, and fold it, keep it as flat as you can and lift it by two corners. You want a nice clean ironing surface, so cover your ironing board with a nice clean white sheet 
and prepare your iron at a nice hot setting, so at the linen setting, which on my iron is about number three. Lay your linen out nice and flat on your ironing surface and then you're going to press the linen dry. You can just let it dry off a little bit first if it's really, really wet still. Just let it dry in the air a little. And then whilst it's still nice and damp, just press over the surface. It's better to keep the iron moving than just hold it on because you can scorch the linen that way. But keep the iron moving and iron until it's dry. Now, it's better not to cover the linen when you do that because you can end up pressing creases in with another fabric or tissue paper over the top, scrunching as you go. So I press directly onto the linen. The only thing with that is it will shine the linen very, very slightly. So I just make that the back of my linen then when I've finished. So um, I just um, mark it so that I know which is the back and which is the front. Um, but it's the best way to get your linen beautifully, beautifully smooth and, and ready for use. <coughs> so we have frayed back the linen so that we've got a continuous thread on all edges and then I'm just going to use my fabric scissors and trim back that fray. It's almost not necessary because there's not too much there but it's just nice and neat that way. There we go. I'm just going to work around that on all four edges. taking care not to snip any of the long linen threads. By the way, I'm only working on a brown paper um, work surface here so that you can see what I'm doing with the linen. But the key thing, of course, is when you're doing something like this, particularly with white fabric, because it's prone to picking up dirt, just make sure you've really thoroughly cleaned your work surface before you begin. And I'm working on paper as opposed to a fabric um, to allow me to see, but so that I'm not gonna pin into the, the fabric underneath and so that there's no lint coming off that. If you work on a dark colored fabric, often you'll get lint um, coming off onto your white linen. So we'll shake off all those bits. And we've got our nice clean piece of fabric. So, um, now we need to put a piping cord in down the edges. So we're going to turn the linen so that our edge, which is going to be attached to the webbing, is running away from me now. And the edge which I'm going to pipe, where my stringing will be, is facing me. So I'm just going to begin to fold over one centimetre. It's about quarter of an inch of linen, just over quarter of an inch. And I'm folding that accurately on the grain or the straight grain of my linen. That's again really important. You don't want to have done all that work fraying back your linen to get it nice and straight and then make it wobbly at this stage. But because the linen is straight and, and very cleanly cut, we can see and you can even measure if you wish to exactly that you're getting that exact measurement across. And the measurement will make sure it's accurate for you, even if you struggle to see a grain on a very fine fabric. So folding over by a centimetre or half an inch, a quarter of an inch, sorry. And then I've got um, some nylon cord. This is the kind of cord that you would use for um, pull cords and blind cords, things like that. You can usually get it from a hardware shop. Um, again, we sell this on the website. Um, I prefer this to cotton string, it's just much easier to work with, it doesn't go fluffy and once you've bought some you can again keep using it forever. Um, you can even wash it if it gets grubby, so it's, it's a useful thing to have, a good investment. So I'm going to take a piece of nylon cord and I'm going to measure it to be very slightly longer than my fabric and cut it off. So I've got about inch, inch and a half. Um, two or three centimetres excess at the end. The exact measurement isn't important. And I'm going to take that piping cord and lay it inside that fold of fabric that I've created. So it's nestled in there like a piping cord. I'm then going to take some nice clean fine pins and I'm going to pin that cord in place. So my pins are pointing towards the cord, they're trapping it 
I'm pushing it neatly into that fold in the fabric and my pins are trapping it in place there. And I'm pinning about, about every inch and a half or so, just using my fingernail to make sure that that cord is pushed nice and tightly into the fold. Now we're going to stitch that cord in place. I'm going to use the sewing machine um, to run a straight stitch along next to it. But if you don't have access to a sewing machine, you can do a hand back stitch along there. And it's this cord that's going to give us the strength for our lacing. So if you can see those pins there, um, pushed into the fabric, pushing that cord tight in to the fold. So that's along one edge. We're then going to turn the fabric round all the way and do exactly the same on the opposite side. So again, keeping to the straight grain as exactly as you can, folding over about a centimetre, just over a quarter of an inch really. And pressing in place all the way along, keeping it as straight as possible. Taking another length of cord, two or three centimetres, inch, inch and a half or so longer, and then we're going to pin in the same way. Make sure that both your folds of fabric are pointing to the same face of the fabric, so don't flip the fabric over. They both want to be coming to what will be the back of your fabric. So the folded fabric coming to the back. Remember that if you have pressed the linen um, and it has produced a, a slight shine on the surface, make sure you have remembered to make that the back of your fabric. So again, we're going to put pins in every sort of inch and a half or so, trapping that piping cord into the fold. Make sure it's nestled in there nice and tightly. So there we have our two edges pinned left and right and ready for machining. Okay. Right, so now we're ready to machine our prepared edges. Um, I've set my machine up with blue thread. Now, if I was doing this on a real piece, I would thread it with white thread. Just it, it looks nice to have the thread matching. It's probably not important, but it just looks nicer. I'm using blue just so you can see the stitching a little bit more clearly. Um, I've replaced my normal foot with a zipper foot. Um, so that I can run next to the piping cord um, easily. I've set my machines to, to straight stitch and then to about two and a half, three size straight stitch. So not too big, not too small. Um, so I'm going to pop my fabric in um, under the foot and align the foot to the left hand side of my piping cord. And then I'm going to machine, I'm just going to do a little reverse at the beginning and then just ease that through, sitting nice and tight up against the piping cord. So trapping it nice and firmly into the fold line. Little reverse at the end, and then we're done. Just going to ease that out and clip off threads. Now we're going to do that on the other side 
in a moment, exactly the same. But before I do that, I'll just show you what I'd also do on this side. Um, notice, by the way, that having the pins in running at right angles to my cord allowed me just to machine straight over those. So there was no need to tack this or anything. Those pins hold it nice and steady. I'm just going to move to a zigzag and change my foot to my ordinary foot. Now, usually if I was um, doing both sides, I would hop to the other side and do my straight stitch to hold the piping cord in place first, then change foot to allow me to do the, um, the zigzag. However, I just want to show you the zigzag. I won't make you watch me doing both sides. So I'm going to pop that under and I'm just going to zigzag the raw edge of the linen. That's simply so that it's not going to fray at any point while I'm working with it. It just neatens it, it looks nicer, but mainly so that it doesn't fray and, and catch as you're working. So we're just going to work a nice broad zigzag along the edge of the linen. So we have a nice straight stitch holding the piping cord in place and a zigzag running alongside it. And then we're going to repeat exactly the same process on the other side. Okay, so now we've prepared the sides of the frame with the piping cord, um, we can attach the fabric to the slate frame. So I've got the first roller of my slate frame here and I'm going to place that in front of me with the loose webbing pointing away from me. I'm going to take a ruler, a ruler is generally better than a tape measure, it's a little bit more accurate, and I'm going to measure. This only needs to be done when it's a brand new slate frame and you need to find its centre for the very first time. Now, it's not a good idea to measure the webbing to find its centre because the webbing can move, of course. So instead, I'm going to measure from the very end of the roller, from the tip of the wood to the far end. So we're 52 and a half, so that's 25, 26.25. And I'm going to take a fine permanent marker pen and just mark that centre point as a nice clear mark. So that will stay on there forever. I would then do exactly the same with the second roller. So place that down and measure. They should measure exactly the same. So, but do always check, okay? Mark both centres. So moving that second roller away, and we've got that first one again sitting in front of us with the loose webbing falling away from me. I've placed my linen now so that the piped edges are to the east and west, left and right, and my raw edges are at the top and bottom, north and south. At that southern end, I'm going to, from the centre outwards, fold over, again exactly on the straight grain of the linen, one centimetre or just over quarter of an inch of linen. Again, if you struggle to see the grain of the linen exactly, then measure to be sure that you're accurate all the way along.
And if you're using a fabric where the grain is really hard to see, say like a satin or something like that, again, measuring is more important to be sure you're keeping that straight. Okay, so we've got our um, fabric turned under. And I'm now going to find the centre of that piece of fabric simply by folding it in half. So putting the two piping cords together, pulling tight against them, and I'm going to pinch the centre there to make a firm mark so that I can see where that is. If you want to put a pin in at that point, you can. I'm then going to take that centre point in my linen and match it to the webbing. Now the webbing um, is pointing upwards here, so that loose webbing is pointing upwards and my linen with the fold coming towards the roller is also pointing upwards and I'm going to match those two together. And then I'm going to take a pin and pin them together. I'm then from that centre point going to continue to pin all the way out to the left. So I'm aligning the fold in the linen with the edge of the webbing as accurately as possible. And putting my pins in, pointing southwards. So biting just into the edge of both fabrics and then bringing the pin out again. And I'm pinning about every inch all the way out to the side. And we should find that our piping sits just at the edge of the webbing there. And then we're going to do the same out to the right hand side. So starting at the centre again, aligning the folded edge of the linen carefully with the edge of your webbing, pin every inch out to the right hand side. So the fold in the linen is tucked neatly between your linen and the webbing, so you can't see it. and right out to the end again. Don't worry that the piping cord is folded over at that point. It's meant to be, that's absolutely fine. Okay. We would then do the same process on the other side. So we swing the fabric round. Don't turn it over or anything, just swing it round. Bring in your second roller, place it next to you with the loose webbing falling away from you. Fold over your centimetre of linen again and find the centre and mark it by pressing or putting a pin, match your centres and then working out to the left, pinning every inch, every couple of centimetres and then out to the right doing the same thing. So both rollers will be then tensioned away from each other. Okay. So here I'm going to attach the linen to the webbing. So I've got my centre point marked on the webbing and I've found the centre point on my linen by folding the linen in half. I'm going to take that centre point and match it to the mark on my webbing. So you can see here that the linen is folded, so the fold, the raw edge is tucked inside next to the webbing. And I'm lifting the webbing up so that I've got this um, finished edge here rising up to the top and I'm matching my fold in the linen exactly with that edge of the webbing. So I'm going to pin that centre point to begin, that's really important that that's nice and accurate, and I'm putting my pin in like so. So it's just at the top here catching the edge of the linen and the edge of the webbing, and then emerging pointing downwards like that. So you're working upright like this with the two aligned together. So place your linen fold with the edge of your webbing, and again, about an inch or so apart, pin. And then we're working along again. And then about an inch. And so on. Out to the sides. Just keep the linen as smooth as you can. Don't pull it, you don't want to, to be straining it, but keep it really nice and smooth. At the end, you will find that you're folding over the um, piping cord as well, but that's absolutely fine. That's part of the process. We then move back to the centre and we'll do exactly the same out in the other direction. So 
pulling against the center very slightly, but, but not tight. We're just smoothing the linen every inch again out to the right hand side. And then again, just laying that piping cord up against the webbing at the end and popping a pin at the tip. And our linen is, because we calculated it carefully, it's fitting just to the ends of the webbing there, which is exactly what we want. Okay, and there we go. Okay, so we're now going to stitch the linen to the webbing. Um, I've got some strong button thread here. You'd need to use a thread with a nice bit of strength to it. This is impossible to break. Um, I tend to use Coates Duet thread, um, and that's what we have on the website, nice and strong. And I would generally, again, use a, a white or an ivory to match your fabric. Um, it's also quite a good idea to use a pale colour so that um, nothing from the thread marks your fabric, although it shouldn't matter desperately much at, at this point in the framing up. So um, a pale one um, generally, but I'm using a dark one here just so you can see my stitches. I've got a number seven embroidery needle, or if you find those hard to thread, you could use a 24 chenille needle, which has a nice big eye, but a sharp point. It's very important to start your stitching at the center again. So here's our mark and our red pin where we began pinning at the middle. I'm not going to use a knot on my thread. I've just got a fairly long length of um, thread with, with a, um, a cut end. So working about a centimeter, half an inch to the left of the red pin, I'm going to hold my fabric up as I did when I was pinning. So it's um, pointing directly upwards, the linen and the webbing. And I can see that nice crisp edge where the two are aligned together. I'm going to push my needle through nice and straight. Um, so I'm not pushing it through at an angle coming upwards or downwards. It's just pushing through nice and straight at right angle to that plane of fabric. And that needle is about, I would say, two millimeters about a sixteenth of an inch depth into the, the linen and the webbing. So we want to be sure we're getting that same depth on either side. Okay, so I'm going to pull the thread through and I'm going to leave a tail and I'm going to hold that tail with my finger. Now, if you find that tricky, of course you could start with a knot and then cut it away. I just don't bother with a knot at this point. Then skipping along by about an eighth of an inch or about three to four millimetres, we're going to pierce the linen and the webbing again in the same way. But this time I'm only biting about a millimetre, um, about a thirty tooth of an inch deep into the linen. If you can see there, it's much shallower than the previous stitch. It's same on both sides, but it's shallower. So we've gone from a, a slightly deeper stitch to a slightly smaller stitch and we're going to pull through and we're going to pull up tight, keeping hold of that tail again so that it doesn't pull out. On the next stitch, I'm going to go slightly deeper again. So about three to four millimeters jump between the previous one and the next stitch position. And I'm going to dig into the two layers by about two millimeters, 16th of an inch or so from the top. And I'm gonna pull that through pull up nice and tight again. It's very, very important that as we start to work these over sewing stitches that you'd pull them tight. They will not serve their purpose of attaching your fabric thoroughly to your webbing if you don't. If you just stitch when you then tension the slate frame, the stitching will pull apart and it, it, it will cause all sorts of problems. So do pull up tight. The next stitch is a shallow stitch. So only going in by about a millimeter a 30 tooth of an inch or so and again pull up tight and you should be able to see that those stitches are slanting okay so it's a real over sew these are not tight together and they've got a bit of space between them and they're slanting so it's a whipping stitch really and at the center we're going into the slightly deeper stitch again so the sort of two millimeter sixteenth of an inch dip depth stitch and I'm going to take that pin out now and pull up. So we've worked to center 
and I've pull, I'm going to pull those up really nice and tight. My reason for doing this is to really cast on my thread in a really secure and, and flat and neat way. If I did a few over sewing stitches on a spot as we might do on other things that's going to cause a lump which can cause distortion of your fabric on the frame. So over sewing along I'm now going to reverse my direction from centre and work back out to the left doing exactly the same thing. So a shallow one millimetre stitch and then a slightly deeper two millimetre stitch. Just digging in one millimetre depth from the top and then a two millimetre depth from the top. So we're alternating. The reason for alternating is so that you don't put strain on one grain of the fabric. You want those stitches to be as even in depth as you can but as two tiers of stitching, so a slightly shallower one, a slightly deeper one, and thereby we're distributing the strain that the frame is going to put on the weave of that linen. If we keep to, um, to one line, potentially the linen could pull apart along that grain line, and that's not going to give us the strength we need. That's less um, prone to happen on a fabric like this, a very fine weave fabric, but say you had something like a canvas, which is quite an open weave, and you stitched along one grain line, you would find that that's, that fabric would open up along that line. So every time my needle enters the fabric, it's going in really straight, so at right angle to the plane of the fabric. And I keep my fabric upright so that I'm sure that every time I bite the needle through that I'm picking up the same depth of fabric on either side and every stitch I do I pull nice and tight. There is no need to look and check that you're exactly on the same grain at the one millimeter and two millimeter depth every time. I'm judging that by eye and that's sufficiently accurate because we folded the, um, the linen accurately so we know we're, we're nice and straight. Just be sure that you're not suddenly traveling down a lot deeper on, on one side, keep checking. The rhythm sort of comes with practice. Make sure that you're really pulling up that slack with every single stitch. That's very, very important. If you find that hard to do, you could take a tool and work your way along and just pull any slack that's still remaining in the stitches. I don't bother with that, I try and pull it up as I go along, but if you find that difficult to, to do with your hands, then that's a, a way you could achieve that. It's also a good idea, if you find your thread slipping, to just do a couple of stitches on the spot every so often, and that will help you lock the tension on that section you've done. So don't do it too often and don't bind and bind and mind. Just a couple of stitches on the spot will be quite useful just to lock that tension in. So we're going all the way to the end now. Keeping that upright, pinching that fabric between your finger and thumb all the time. Pulling tight on every stitch. Taking the pins out as we go. If you did run out of thread part of the way along your, your over sewing, you would finish your thread in the same way as we're about to do now. So we'll show you how to do that here. And that can be done if you were on a much bigger frame and you had to cast on several lengths of thread to get all the way to the end. So as we near the end, we continue. And our last stitch is going to stab through that piping cord. You might need to use a thimble um, for that bit. And then we're going to reverse, push that through there. Oops. And then we're going to do exactly the same as we did at the beginning. Work about five over sewing stitches back over the section we've just worked so that that's a nice flat and secure finish. Okay. And to cast off the thread rather than just cutting it, which could potentially come undone, I'm just going to run it through the webbing for a quarter of an inch centimetre or so and pull it through and then cut off. Okay, and that's our process. So we're then going to do the same on the right hand side and we do exactly the same thing. So we get another length of our button thread and thread that into our number seven needle. 
and then again just starting slightly to the right of centre I'm going to just leave my little tail and pinch that between my fingers and work back over it and then exactly the same over sewing process so digging in by about a millimetre and then by about two millimetres or a thirty tooth and a sixteenth of an inch Pull them up nice and tight. I tend to use quite a long thread for this, longer than I might normally do. Um, the thread, the, the heavy thread behaves quite well and doesn't tend to knot, so we can get away with that. And it's better to use a slightly longer thread than have to join it in in the middle um, more than necessary. It can just make your frame more lumpy. And then we finish at the right hand end in exactly the same way. So we now have our two rollers, um, both stitched to the webbing at either end of our, our frame. Now we're going to be putting um, the arms in very soon, but before we do that, I'm going to put some protective fabric um, into the frame. This is really useful to do this at this stage because it's then trapped inside your roller and you'll be able to just swing this round to the top to, to protect your fabric. So we're going to turn the rollers over now to the back and I've got two pieces here of a material called Tyvek. Um, you don't have to use Tyvek but it's a, a really useful material to use. Um, it comes from the building trade and it's also used a lot for um, storage of textiles in the conservation world. Um, the good thing about it is that um, it has a very smooth surface so that when that's going to be lying against your embroidery, when you bring it round to cover your embroidery, it's not going to cause any abrasion or leave any fibres at all. So it's non-fibrous. Um, it's also breathable, so it's, it's really good for storage in that sense. Um, and it's also washable, so when you've got a piece of it and you use it on your slate frame, you can wash it if it gets dirty, if it's on the frame for a while, and so you can keep reusing it for other slate frames as well. The alternative to use is acid-free tissue paper, which works just as well, but the downside of that, of course, is it can tear and you have to keep um, using a new piece. So this is quite good for long-term use. So the Tyvek has a slightly softer side and a slightly more shiny side. I'm going to place this down so that the slightly softer side is laying against the back of my linen. I've cut the piece, by the way, so that it fits across the full width of my work, so across the width of the webbing, so about 15 inches. And I've cut it plenty long enough so that when I um, pull the, the slate frame tight, I can swing it round to the front and it will travel over most of my work. I'm then going to get a couple of pins <coughs> and I'm slotting the raw edge of the Tyvek or the tissue paper, if that's what you're using, into the groove between the roller and the reverse of the webbing. So tie it into that groove and I'm going to pin it at either side. You don't want to, I mean you could just put pins in and leave those in here but they actually cause a problem when you then roll up your slate frame and they're going to cause a bump at those ends. So instead I've got a fine embroidery needle and a little bit of ordinary sewing thread, just some ordinary Gutterman thread. And I'm going to work a few stitches into the webbing, replacing the pin, just a few over sew stitches on the spot without gathering it up at all. They don't need to be beautiful stitches. I'm not starting with a knot, or if I did, I would cut the knot away. Three or four stitches on the spot just to settle that in place in a nice flat way. And then I'm going to repeat that at the right hand end. Make sure that you've eased the, the um, tissue paper or the Tyvek smooth across to the far side. Don't let it bunch up at all. So there we have our Tyvek secured.
So just to show you that um, Tyvek being attached in a little bit more detail. So I've placed the Tyvek down here and it's got that slightly softer side facing the reverse of the linen and the shiny side uppermost. That's so that when we swing the Tyvek round to the front of the work, the shiny side will be facing the work. So I'm going to position it, uh, the raw edge of the Tyvek, the cut edge here, tucked nice and snugly into that groove between the webbing and the roller. So sitting in this groove here and sitting up against the piping cord on the left hand side here. So sitting that in nice and flat and popping in a pin and repeating at the other end so that there's a little bit of tension across the tie back and then taking our little bit of Gutterman thread, just ordinary sewing thread, remove the pin and then secure the tie back with a couple of over sewing stitches. They don't have to be beautiful, they just need to hold it in place temporarily whilst we roll up the frame. So I've got about four stitches there, leave a little tail, no knot, and that's all it is. Make sure that that's tucking in nice and neatly there. You can see that sitting nice and flat into the groove. And then we're going to repeat at the far end. So removing the pin. And then catching into the webbing with my fine needle and my sewing thread. That, a few over sewing stitches and then clip off and that's done. So now we're ready to tighten the frame by putting the arms in. Um, we now need to just flick these two pieces of Tyvek or, or tissue paper out of the way if you've used that and we're going to turn the frame over to the front again. Just flick them out to the sides. And to bring my two arms in here and I'm going to roll my first arm sorry my first roller in here until the holes are sitting so that they're going to allow the arms to go through flat and then I'm going to roll the other end in so I've got the same situation now what's happened now is the um, the stitched line where the linen is secured to the webbing has rolled round the roller a little way. Now that's preferable to that stitched line sitting on the top, which is why in the first place I suggested you cut your linen a little longer than it is wide, or if anything, quite a bit longer. Your tension will be much better and it will put much less strain on that stitching if that's rolled round the roller a little distance like that, rather than sitting directly on the top here. So I've rolled, I haven't rolled in much at the moment, so I've got a nice big working area because I'm going to need that to comfortably trace on my design. You may find when you actually work on the piece that you would like a smaller working area. And at some point you may like to remove the arms and roll in a little bit further so you can have a smaller, more compact work area. Then unrolling the design later on if required. You may also, as we discussed, have a much longer design, a design that, that travels um, a long way along the linen. And of course, at this stage, you would now want to roll the majority of that in so that it, it's tucked onto the roller to access later. You would need to decide whether you're going to start at one end of the design and therefore roll all the excess fabric onto the far roller, or if you would prefer to work in the middle and then work out from the center. Both are, uh, both are absolutely fine. So you can see now that this Tyvek here can be flipped over to the front to protect the work, as can the Tyvek at the other end. So we've got a nice parcel there of that protective fabric or tissue paper to keep the, the fabric clean while we're working and to put it to bed at night. So I'm now going to take one of my arms and slot it through the holes in the slate frame and pop it through the other one. 
make sure that you have got the arms the same way round. Um, sometimes they vary slightly from one end to the other. So make sure you've not turned the arm and that the holes there aren't aligning. Make sure they do align. A good way to do that is to lay one arm on top of the other and hold it up to the light and make sure you can see through all the holes comfortably. When they're made, we put one arm on top of the other and drill through both together so the holes will always align. Take your other arm and pop it through on the far side and they should slide through nice and comfortably. Slide them through so there's a, a fairly even amount of the arm sticking out at either end. We now take our split pins and we're going to put them in at the top right to begin with. So I'm going to count the holes. There are two runs of holes. Um, slightly staggered. That's so that we can have slightly um, smaller increments of, of spacing and therefore adjust the tension um, more subtly. On the outer row I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and pop in my peg. So on the far outside edge of the slate frame. And where I had those holes, they begin at the, the furthest point here. So I'm looking for the same run of holes on this side, and I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven again. Now, just using my, my hands to gently begin to tension now, I'm going to stretch the frame out. I need to keep that even on the two sides. It's a great mistake to tension one side a lot more than the other. So pushing it as far as I can by hand, but not excessively, I'm going to pop my peg in on the right hand side. And I'm going to count again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That just happens to be seven. That's not always the case um, that it's the same as the top. So don't be confused by that. On the left hand side, again, following the same row of holes, I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I can comfortably pull that by hand. If you find that hard to do with your hands, then get someone to help you. I'm now going to see if I can just by hand tension that another peg further. So to the right, I'm going to pull and I can. I'm going to move it just one peg or one hole further. And then to the left, pushing by hand again, I can move one more. We'll see if we can do another one. The fabric will start to give a little bit as you do this. So we're going to move one more on the right and one more on the left. We'll try again. I'm going to move one more on the right. And just about we can do one more on the left. That's where you could do with an assistant to pull for you while you put the peg in. Now another thing we can do to help to get even more tension on the fabric is to put the frame up like so. Now you can actually on the table now push really really hard, put your weight onto the frame to push down on the roller and to then move the peg another step. You can even rest your frame on the floor and gently rest your foot on the ledge here and push against that to get even more tension. But I would say that pushing your weight like this onto the frame, I can't comfortably get that to go to the next hole. Um, there's, there's real strong tension there, so I think we're fine there. I'm going to move to the far side, and I'm gonna do the same again. So with a bit of pushing, I can reach the next hole. Again, get someone to help you with that, so you're not straining anything. And you can feel that that lovely smooth tension is now starting to come across your linen. Okay, so we're going to lay that down now. And I'm just going to flop the um, Tyvek out of the way again for the moment, because we're about to now start lacing the sides of your frame. So we're now going to look at how we lace the slate frame. And um, so I've got my frame here on my work table and I'm just going to, I've just flopped the tie back out of the way and I'm just going to move the frame so that it's now hanging over the edge of the table. I've got a stiletto here. This is one of my father's handmade stilettos. They're turned from stainless steel and these are ideal for starting to make the holes along the edge of the linen where we're going to be putting the lacing cord through. 
Um, you need something that's got a nice sharp fine point, but also that tapers to being a little bit broader so we can push a decent size hole through the fabric. Um, if you haven't got a stiletto, something like a knitting needle or something like that will do. Um, do make sure it's really clean. The joy of stainless steel is that it, it stays nice and clean and it isn't going to mark your fabric. Particularly if you've got an old stiletto, sometimes they can leave a bit of a mark behind. So make sure it's nice and clean. Then moving to the edge of the fabric here, you can see the first hole that I've made here. Now this is sitting, we're, we're a little in from the roller here, I suppose it's probably about half an inch for our first hole. So half an inch from the edge of the roller coming into the first hole. And the hole is positioned between the um, straight machine sewing that secures the piping in place and the zigzag. So it's really important that your holes are placed at that, that point. Now we're going to place a hole in the same way about every inch or I would say about every two fingers width. Push the stiletto in. This is why we're working over the edge of the table so that you can push the stiletto downwards. If you're sitting down to do it, just make sure that you haven't got fingers or knees or anything under here. Just take a little bit of care. Push and twist the stiletto rather than just ramming it in and that will open up a hole in the linen. The joy of a lovely smooth stiletto is that you're not actually breaking any fibres of the fabric either, you're just pushing them apart. So you're not um, ch changing the strength of the fabric at all. Now, you can be doing this process with fabrics like a duchess satin, a canvas, um, obviously with linens. Any fabric that you're working with can be um, treated in this way. Although it seems pretty brutal, it's actually not as brutal as it appears. So pushing a hole about every inch, or as I said, about every two fingers width apart, all the way to the end. So our last hole is again roughly about half an inch centimetre from the edge of the roller. You don't want a huge gap at the end. We want to take a lacing cord right to the, as close as possible to the end like that. Okay. Now we've now got our nylon cord again. Um, I'm working from the cone so I can just leave it on the cone and then continue to pull off what I want. Um, for a 15 inch slate frame you'll need between three and a half to four meters for each side of your frame. It's better to have too much than not enough. I'm going to put my cone of cord on the floor and I'm now going to take a packing needle. As you can see, this is a needle with um, a tapered point. It's not actually desperately sharp. It's, it's quite blunt, although it looks pretty vicious. And it's about sort of four inches long with a little bit of a bend to it and a nice big eye. Um, this is to allow you to get the cord through the fabric easily. So we're going to thread the end of the cord into the needle there. Now I'm going to specifically start at the left hand end. It doesn't have to be left to right. I tend to work that way because I'm right handed, but you do need to be consistent. So when we do this side of the frame, we're going to work left to right, or you could work right to left if you prefer. When we turn the frame, we're going to do the same thing. And there's a reason for that, which we'll explain in a moment. So for safety's sake, we're going to push the packing needle downwards. Again, watch your hands, your knees, anything like that underneath that you could hurt with that large needle. And we're going to pull it through. If you've made the hole big enough, it should go through with a gentle tug without having to pull too hard. So we come round the, the arm and then into hole number two. Just ease it up, round the arm, into hole number three and so on. I'm not putting any tension on the cord at the moment. I'm just pulling it up so that it's sitting nice and neatly around the arm. There's no strain on the linen at the moment. So when I get to the, the stage where I haven't got enough cord now, I'm going to pull a little bit more through and just work my way along so that I can continue lacing. So if you are having to tug a lot to get that needle through, then just use your stiletto again, just to open up the holes a little more. It's often the case that they're not big enough when you do it the first time because everyone's a little bit scared 
of the process. So we pull it through and then I've got about um, a foot 30 centimetres or so of cord left at the end, which is just about right for tying off at the end. So I'm going to remove the needle and trim off my cord at the left hand end to a similar amount, about 30 centimetres or so. Now at the left hand end, going back there, we're going to just pull on the string a little and wrap it round the arm of the slate frame. I'm actually now going to tie this off permanently because we're unlikely to need to undo that um, in the future. And we're going to just tie a couple of slip knots around that arm like that. So they're literally just a couple of, of quick knots there. They're not so tight that I couldn't undo them. Um, if you are going to be unrolling and rolling your frame a little bit more, it may be worth doing a proper slip knot there. But my frame is pretty much going to stay at the same size it is throughout this project. So I can tie that off. The reason I can tie that off at that end is I'm going to tighten the cording from the left to the right and if I need to do that at any point during the project I will do the same thing so I won't need to undo this left hand knot. So we're now going to tighten but not fully. I'm just going to do a very gentle pull working my way along from left to right picking up the top cord each time and pulling against the wooden arm. OK, we always pull up the cord in the same direction that you laced, so hence left to right. That's really important and I'll show you why. If we changed and we laced from right to left, or sorry, we pulled from right to left, let's just tie that off a moment, we would be pulling like so. And there we're pulling against the fabric and straining it and potentially you could have issues here. When we work from left to right tensioning, we're pulling against the arm and that gives us more leverage to get some more tension and it's not putting strain on these holes in the fabric in the same way. So you're pulling from left to right. So it's gentle, gentle tension at the moment. It's very important to not over tension this side before we've laced the other. In fact, I can see a very slight bow in the linen here and I'm just going to slacken mine off just a little bit where I've been messing about with the tension there so that I can keep that pretty much straight. You can measure if you want to to make sure that you've not tensioned one area more than another. I tend to do that by eye. And that looks fairly good at the moment. So at the right hand end, I'm just going to wrap my cord round at the moment and nothing else. I'm just going to slip it under this cord here to trap it. So not finishing off at all at the moment. I'm now going to turn the frame around and do exactly the same at the other side. So I'm going to take my stiletto and I'm going to pierce my holes every inch, every two fingers, all the way along, sitting in that channel of linen between the machine straight stitch and the machine zigzag. I'm then going to take my cord and my packing needle again and we're going to lace again. Pulling plenty through and popping through each time. Now, some framing up methods involve adding a strip of webbing along the sides of the, the fabric instead of doing this piping cord method. Um, it's, it's not my preferred method. I find that more cumbersome. Um, I love how tight this method allows you to get the fabric, how quick and easy it is and how neat it is. It just has a pleasing neatness to it. So all the way along to the right, let's just pull a little bit more string through. And then I'm going to trim that again to about a foot 30 centimetres at the right and the left. 
and the same thing again. So we're just going to wrap the string round at the left hand end and then I'm going to tie a couple of knots. So I'm just slipping that round this diagonal piece of cord here and up through my, my working loop. There's nothing special about that. Just round and up through. A couple of little easy knots there just to tie that off reasonably permanently at the moment. Then again, picking up the top cord and pulling against the leverage offered by the wooden arm, we can work our way along. Keep your eye on this distance here to make sure that you're keeping the tension nice and even and you're not distorting the fabric at any one particular point. Again, we're not putting enormous tension on at the moment. There's still a bit of squishiness in the fabric. This is just gradually starting to pull up the tension of the fabric. But we're evenly doing that a little bit on both sides of the work until we've got full tension e equally evenly on both sides. So again, we're just going to wrap the excess cord round at the end, tuck it under the cord temporarily at the moment. I'm now going to turn the frame again and go back to the first side. So now we're going to do the second pull on this side and then we'll do the same on the other. And this should give us a really nice drum tight tension on the fabric. So starting at the left again, I'm going to pull using that arm for leverage and work my way along really now pulling up. If you find it hard to do this, you'd be better to do it in smaller stages. So keep pulling a little and then a little more and a little more and a little more. So do it two or three or even four times until you've got all the slack out of the fabric. Generally two pulls is enough if you uh, feel strong enough to, to do that. You will often find when you've prepared a new slate frame that after two or three days or say a whole day of working on it, your fabric will start to soften a little. That's just a little bit of give in your string coming out and you may find you need to pull it, one, pull it up one more time. Once you've done that with nylon cord, that tension tends to remain really beautifully for a long time. It's unlikely for it to soften at all. If it does, of course, give it another pull, but it's really, really good for maintaining tension over a long period. So I'm just going to wrap round again. I'm just going to go back over. I think I can just get a little bit more out there. And I'm just keeping my eye on this evenness here to make sure it's as even as I can possibly get. And then last pull putting my finger on here so that I don't lose any slack and then wrapping round to get rid of all that excess. It's much better to have a decent bit to wrap around here so you're not faffing around near the end of your cord for tying. Now we need to do this, this special knot which worries everybody here. If you can't get your head round doing a special knot, there is absolutely no need to worry. You could just simply latch your cord under here and tie any old kind of knot just temporarily. Just tie a little slip knot like this. Tie it up tight, but, but tie it round. And that will hold as long as you've wrapped around plenty of times. Ideally, we would do this. So we bring the cord from this corner here. So from the far corner out over the top of your lacing. I like to go to this second um, lacing spot here. I pass the cord over the top of that and round and underneath it, emerging to the arm side of that cord. So it's on this side as opposed to the upper side here. So to the bottom, next to the arm. I get hold of that cord and I pull so that again, you're taking any slack out of this cord here. So that's nice and tight. I then make a loop in the cord and that loop is just, is working towards the linen. So working round in this direction towards the linen side. We then take this tail here and we push that underneath that lacing cord and find that little loop there emerging up through, grab it and pull it up. So you've got a little slip knot there. So when we want to tighten the frame, we just pull on that cord and that undoes itself and we can undo here and then again tighten from left to right.
I'm going to go through that again. So we bring the cord across, we go to the second lacing cord here, over the top, down and underneath, emerging to the arm side of that working cord. Pull back to get rid of the slack and then fold back and make a loop towards the linen. So towards the linen here. Pick up your working cord, swing it round and find a little loop there emerging through the first loop. Grab that loop and pull up. Don't let the tail pop through. If the tail pops through, then we've got a, a, a slightly more permanent knot. Pull it up and there we have a nice secure knot that will hold while you're working, but which we can remove when we want to tighten the frame. So we're now going to turn the frame again so that we can do exactly the same on the other side. So starting at the left, again, pulling nice and firmly, we're going to pull using the arm for leverage, keeping an eye on that equidistant gap between the edge of the linen, the piping cord and the arm. And you can see all that slack coming out of the fabric and we're starting to get this beautiful, beautiful drum tight surface. Once you've worked on a slate frame, it's very hard to go back to a hoop because it's such a delight to work on. It's absolutely beautiful. So again, we're going to wrap round once, well, a few times, just back to the beginning. I'm gonna give it one more little pull to make sure that I've got everything out of there that I can at the moment. And then on the right, undo the wrapping again take out that last bit of slack, keep your finger to stop any tension slipping and then wrapping around. I think hmm, that's one too many because I want a nice decent cord to do my knot. And again, going to the second lacing, wrapping round with the um, cord emerging on the arm side, pulling back, making a loop towards the linen, pushing round and finding that little loop emerging through the working loop and pull through. And there's your slip knot. Wiggle that nice and tight and there we go. We can now bring our Tyvek round and we have that nice little parcel to protect your frame. So we've now laced the slate frame and we've got our exquisite tension across the fabric um, evenly pulled in all directions and it's, it's just a joy. It makes you want to stitch on it straight away. Um, so I'm now going to bring my Tyvek or my tissue paper, whichever you've chosen to use, round to the front and that's going to protect my work. So while I'm working I might want to fold that round um, and fold it into a couple of layers so that I can pin it down here or you can use a couple of magnets either side of the frame and that protects the work from your arms rubbing on the fabric while you're stitching and the same at the top here and I can bring that round and pin and secure that there again while I'm working. I would also um, suggest that you cover as much of your working area of your fabric as possible while you're stitching with tissue paper or more pieces of Tyvek. We could bring these in further so we can just expose a smaller working area at a time. The more you protect the fabric surrounding your design and the areas of design that you've already worked, the better because it's going to give you a much better result overall and much cleaner and, and neater. Um, so, and also at night, of course, I was going to say, we can bring that fabric right over the work, put a couple of pins or magnets there, and that will keep it clean overnight. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you um, with the framing up method is I'm just going to put a couple of pins to hold that tie back in place. I'm going to turn the frame to the back and then we supply these with the slate frames, they're little rubber um, silicon ends and these are really handy to put on your split pins at the back 
so that you don't risk catching your arm on the slightly sharp ends. They usually want to be trimmed a little bit, so I'm going to trim that back to about a centimetre, and then I'm going to slot that on to the ends of my split pins. Sometimes I need to just push the rollers apart a little bit to get that to happen. So just four of those on the back, just to protect the ends. And it also helps them um, from catching on your thread while you're your stitching as well. There we go. So put on your, your four of those and then your frame is ready to roll. And I was also going to just show you how I would work with a slate frame. So this is a, a Lowry clamp. It's a floor standing Lowry stand. Um, these are, are superb. Um, I really like them and they're great for smallish slate frames. They won't work for large slate frames, or they will if you've got two of them. You can clamp the, the frame between two. Once you go to anything bigger than a 15 inch frame, you really need to be using something like a set of trestles, um, traditional trestles. Um, but for a 15 inch frame, what I do is I pop my frame, just move that forward a little bit, undo the clamp here, and you can pop your frame into the clamp there and tighten. It's better to put the clamp on the roller rather than on the arms of your frame because it's stronger and steadier there. I do recommend that you put a piece of felt into the jaw of the clamp so that that's protecting your fabric from the pressure of the clamp um, a little bit. And you will find that that's fairly nice and stable. And um, so that's a nice handy, neat way of working for a small slate frame. If you're working with a bigger frame, you can also clamp um, at the side and then rest the other side of your frame on a table. So that's another method. But these are brilliant for the 8, 10, 12, 15 inch slate frames. And one more thing to show you, um, this is a slate frame which has been framed up with organza. So you would think that the rather brutal framing up method wouldn't be suitable for organza, um, but it is. And it's a fabulous way of working with a very large piece of organza for a big embroidery. Um, all we've done here is rather than turning over just the edges of the organza, we've put a bias binding strip of just cotton calico around all four edges of the organza by using the machine prior to framing up. Once you've bound all four edges with the cotton, the framing up can be done in exactly the same way. And it does give the most glorious tension across the organza and allows you to work on something translucent. And that's a really big slate frame as well, so you can see it works for, for quite a sizeable frame. So, I hope that has given you a bit of an insight into the mysteries of the slate frame and um, shown that it's not terribly hard to use one. It takes a bit of time, but it's a labour of love. And as I said before, once you've started using a slate frame, you won't want to go back because they're just beautiful to work on. And the results, um, the, the difference it, it will give to your embroidery is tremendous. And I think it's really worth the time and effort. There is something rather soothing and lovely about taking the time to prepare for a really important embroidery that you're going to spend many, many hours on in this, this way. It's got a nice sort of ceremony about it. Um, and once it's done, it's just a joy. Once you've completed the embroidery, all we do is, is pull out the lacing, which as I said, can be used again. We release the stitching that's sewing the fabric onto the webbing and your piece will, will come away beautifully. And you will find that the piece will have stayed beautifully tight all through the, the process of working and will therefore be vastly easier to mount onto your board for going into a frame um, when you're ready to do that. It saves so many hassles at, at the end. So I hope this will convert you to slate frames and that you'll enjoy many years of using them. Thank you.